Welcome back everyone to another edition of the Silva Skillet. This week with me is Sarah Stewart and uh, there's all sides of politics. <laughs> Sarah's on the side that's kind of a fun side actually. She's actually tries to help people get elected. So we're going to talk that's a right. lot about that today. She's got a couple great appetizers she's going to prepare for us. I'm going to let her tell you about that. Mm -hmm. But so I don't forget, always want to thank the great people at GM Roth for giving us this beautiful studio, um, which most people want to have in their own home. So come see GM Roth and maybe they can set you up. Sarah, tell us about yourself. Great. Well, thank you for having me here today, Representative. Um, I uh, came to New Hampshire the day after I graduated college. I grew up in the middle of nowhere, Vermont. And I went to University of Vermont and I studied history thinking I would work for a magazine or something like that. But a couple weeks before graduation, a friend of mine who lived in this great state of New Hampshire was hosting an event for John McCain, who then in 1999 was just thinking about running for president the first time. And I went to their house, and there were about 20 people there. It was Memorial Day weekend, um, and I met Senator John McCain from Arizona. Nobody in New Hampshire knew who John McCain was. Sorry. Why, why would we care about a senator from Arizona? But as you know, in New Hampshire with the presidential primaries, it gets very crazy around here a couple months before the primary. And uh, I asked for a job on his campaign and um, was, went through the application process, was accepted and moved to New Hampshire about a week after graduating from college. Never worked on a campaign before, uh, never associated with any party, but just really liked this guy and thought it'd be exciting. And, the rest is history. I fell in love with campaigns. Um, it's an adrenaline rush. It's a lifestyle. Um, it's competitive and high pressure. Um, and after John McCain won that year in New Hampshire, I followed him to South Carolina and to Michigan. And then he finally stepped down. And then I worked for him again this past uh, 28 um, So campaign. let me ask you this, because I've not seen it outside. Is it really is it really unique in New Hampshire? Like, so if you. We, the way we do things here and the way you're doing all these house parties and all this yes. stuff, it really, it really is different. It really, it's really different. And you would not know because people in New Hampshire think that this is normal. <laughs> but it's not. I've, I've worked on campaigns in uh, Michigan, in other New England states, um, and traveled around the country um, helping candidates. And there's nothing like New Hampshire. And it's the people that make it so. New Hampshire is small enough where personal relationships matter. So your, na your neighbor puts out a yard sign, um, that influences people uh, because you respect your neighbor, hopefully, <laughs> and, well, yeah. and sometimes. You know some of my um, neighbors are. <laughs> and you, uh, you learn by talking to people at the grocery store or at the bank um, who they're supporting because you can't hide from it here. It's everywhere. Um, and people are used to candidates coming into their home. I think it's harder for candidates to get used to New Hampshire now than New Hampshire to get used to the, the campaign season because uh, it's it's forever here. It, it doesn't stop. When McCain had the, I don't know if it's original, but it's the first time I'd heard it. And actually, he made the comment at Kelly A, one of Kelly Ayotte's um, functions. Yeah. And she was actually there. He was introducing her, and he said a story of someone who was up north. Yeah. And he said um, he recognized this guy. You know, he said, "So I've seen you before. Do I have your support?" And the guy says, "Well, I don't know. I've only met you three times." Yeah. And so <laughs> I remember going through, I was involved with Perry yeah. and going through trying to mostly get other reps to sign on mm -hmm. in the beginning. And some of these people were saying like, you know, well, tell him if he wants, um, I'll have my house party in Whitefield. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, the, if everyone in Whitefield showed up, there'd be 15 people. That's how they think though. Right. And out of staters, we'll call that being spoiled. But here in the Granite State, we consider it our, our right and our privilege and our duty to really vet these candidates and meet them a few times, um, have them meet our family, see how they are with our kids and our, and our neighbors and our parents, and, and then make a decision. And candidates do have, um, if they choose, have the ability to really get to know people. Some candidates don't, aren't comfortable with that, and it's evident. Um, yeah. you know, some candidates just don't feel good about getting in the mix, but uh, some candidates it's really natural. And I think those are the candidates, win or lose the nomination, do well in New Hampshire. See, I think that's, um, Sarah and I met in the Plenty campaign. Yeah. And I think that's what happened to him a little bit. I mm -hmm. think that he, he seemed like he was trying to recreate himself. When he was just him, Yeah. he was great. Yeah. And then when he got in front of people, it just seemed different. Because yeah. the first time I met him was about a year and a half before the primary. Mm -hmm. He was a keynote speaker in Concord. Yes. 
And I thought he was I don't think that happened on accident, you know. He was well, thinking oh, about oh, oh, no, I'm sure. President. I met his wife yes, then, so and I said, um, <laughs> him and my wife are like four days apart in age, oh. birthday. Um, and I, I don't know, he was different then than yeah. he was when he came back. Yeah. It's an evolution uh, and, and a learning curve for candidates. It's not easy running for president. It's not easy I running for local that. office. Running for president, the pressure is on. You've got all of these staff people that you might not even know, you know, running around. You have to trust people, and when you're bouncing from state to, to state, and it's it's a learning curve. And so, uh, you know, Governor Pawlenty, um, his campaign ended really short <laughs> after the Iowa straw poll. Um, I think if he continued on and had more time here in New Hampshire, he would have caught on. Um, because of his his relaxed sort of um, uh, persona. Yeah, and a lot um, happened after he dropped out. Yeah, a lot happened. They so, kept making one blunder after the other. Oh yeah, I think a lesson that he learned and that other candidates learned from watching his campaign is, you know, you you need to play for the long haul. You, you know, it's not just what happens tomorrow that counts. You have to build a structured campaign to last some pitfalls because. There's, there's a, it's a lengthy campaign season nowadays, and there are ups and downs. Nice. And unless you're built to last, you know, it's a last man standing kind of thing. It's almost, almost like a congressional thing. You always campaign day after yeah. win. Yeah. Well, Sarah's going to make us a couple appetizers. So, what do yeah. we have today, Sarah? Okay, so we're doing two appetizers, and I'm going to say we're going to put the party in the GOP. The okay, grand let's party. go. <laughs> so Excellent. these appetizers will work for anything, for a football party, for a classy cocktail party. Um, people should be impressed, and they're pretty easy to make. Now, I just saw a thing in the news the other day mm -hmm. that conservatives are actually happier people. Really? I just, they did this whole survey between conservatives and liberals. Wow, I'll have to check that survey out. I believe it. <laughs> because we don't have to lie all the time. Right. Um, okay, so we're going to do two, and we're going to start by making um, butternut squash pot stickers, and then about halfway through, I need to freeze them for a few minutes before we cook them. So when we freeze them, we'll jump over and make blue cheese stuffed dates wrapped in bacon, because everything is better in bacon. <laughs> Isn't that true? <laughs> so um, I came prepared with pre-cooked butternut squash, and I um, peeled a butternut squash from the grocery store, cubed it, and then boiled it with some um, brown sugar and soy sauce, and then I mashed it together. But we're gonna add a few more ingredients before we stuff the wontons. Okay. So, um, I found this recipe, um, by the way, online on the Martha Stewart website, and now that my last name is Stewart, I feel like <laughs> I have to- It's spelled the same way. It is, so I have right. to strive to be as, um, perfect in the kitchen as, as Martha, but that's impossible. I don't know about that one. <laughs> so I'm taking um, two uh, scallions, and I'm just going to slice them up really thin. And we're going to save some of the greens from the scallions to decorate the end product. Um, but so now are you, are you always the primary cook in your home or does your husband cook too? I love to cook and I cook a lot, but Chris, uh, my husband Chris loves to cook as well. Um, we live in downtown Manchester and so we don't have a grill, which is a shame because Chris is excellent on the grill and makes delicious barbecued ribs. Um, so whenever we go some, to a friend's house or to a parent's house and they have a grill, that's, that's the, the treat. Um, and I can remember when I first moved here, um, we lived in a condo at Partridgeberry. And back then you could have gas grills, but then they did away. You can't even have yeah. that now. Yeah, I think there's like a 15 or 18 foot rule in Manchester where you can't have grills. So we, we obey and we don't have a grill. I mean, I guess it kind of makes sense in a way if you had everyone with a thing in a right. fire. <laughs> Keep the fire department busy. Um, now we're going to take uh, a nub of ginger and we're going to peel it. Oh, you had to do a smell because it. Because I know it smells so good and it stays with you, which is fine with me. You know, you can get ginger in these huge um, knuckled uh, roots from the grocery store, but they let you cut it down if you don't want to buy the whole thing, which is good because I didn't know that. You don't, you don't use ginger all the time. And then we're going to grate it so it's small because ginger is really fibrous and you don't want to get stuck chewing too much ginger. Well, as of today, we have a Trader Joe's. I'm sure they'll have it oh, in Nashua. Fancy, I bet. We just got a, um, a fresh market in Manchester, and I've been once, and I shouldn't have gone <laughs> because that's where I want to go all the time now. So we're just going to grate this chunk of ginger. 
to make it really small, just to get the flavor into this stuffing. And yes, it does smell delicious. That's, we're still waiting on it. We need the, the uh, smell cam. Yeah. That we'll would 3D be revolutionary. this and revolutionary. The food network would be all over that. So we take some of this really fine ginger and put it in. And I'm going to give this a mix. Actually, let's put these scallions to the side. This way, I always keep a bowl on the counter for garbage because it's just easier than going to the garbage can. Good thing my wife's not here. She'd be telling me that now. <laughs> We're gonna mix. Cardinal rule number one. <laughs> gonna mix this up. So this has, you know, a lot of Asian influence, but butternut squash is something so common in New England and New Hampshire that it's a it's a favorite flavor, I think. And you find butternut squash ravioli at restaurants, but this is just a different twist on that. Yeah, you, de you definitely, um, it's, it's, I'm sure, a real big New England thing. Yeah. It's always. Thanksgiving. It's always at the, at the markets. I don't know, it's always in season, but it seems to be. And you can buy it pre-peeled and chopped too, which makes this a lot easier as well. So this is mixed up pretty good. Now, people are intimidated by wonton wrappers, but they shouldn't be because they're really easy to use. And Representative, do you want to help me stuff some? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Let's grab you a few. Let's get this other cutting board here. You're going to take a white block? Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you two, and I'll That's do two. That's an inside joke for everybody. <laughs> so, I got three here. You have three? Yeah. All right, you can do three. I'll do two. And what we're going to do, now it's always tempting to overstuff these, but you don't want to put too much because then it'll just explode and it won't stay in the wrapper. So you just take, it might even be too much, just a little dollop and put it in the middle of each one. Would you one. say about a teaspoon? Yeah, a little. I'll let you give me my helping so you can't accuse me of overstuffing it. <laughs> well, I was going to mix them up so we wouldn't be <laughs> oh, able yeah, to see? tell. <laughs> <laughs> you really can't go wrong in cooking. You know, if, if you follow the recipe, but you can change it, you can add your own favorite ingredients. There, there are little rules. Baking is different. You have to follow the rules in baking. But in cooking, you just kind of do what, what you want. So before we put the wontons together, I use a little water. I'll put it right here in between us. Okay. And what I do is I just dip my fingers in the water and go along two of the edges. And the water is our glue. So then when we have the along two edges, we fold. So you're putting the dry side onto the wet side. Yep, it doesn't make any difference? No, nope, it doesn't. And you can pick it up and you can just squeeze it together because we want them to really stick. Sometimes I take more water and just really make sure that those edges are sealed. Right, if you want to take a little water and just run it over. More on the edge. Yep. And so when we seal it, then we're going to put it in the freezer to, to seal it a little bit more. It'll stay in the freezer for 10 or so minutes. And it freezes it the middle, but it also lets the, the, um, the sides really stick together. Because we're going to put them in a hot pan, and we don't want them to open up. And if they do, well, you can eat them so in the kitchen all, before it, you serve it, your guests. It's all you, it, just the water makes them just, stick. Yep. That's all you do. You really pinch them together. I'm not convinced I pinched my first one good enough. It's making me nervous now, see? <laughs> it looks How good. are we going to know? Are we going to put our initials in them? Oh, uh, no, I told you I'm going to mix them up. Yeah. <laughs> and you can, you know, you can st stuff anything. I imagine leftovers and whatever you have for leftovers, you can put in a wonton wrapper. Well, my wife is Polish, half Polish. I'm she, half Polish um, too. Oh, are you? Yes. So did you ever make pierogies? I have made pierogies. So my wife's aunt came over about a month, no, a couple months ago now, and they made, I don't even know, <laughs> dozens of them. She 
conjuring and buying this, um, she calls it her machine, but it's a, just a bread maker, yeah. you know? And it was a pierogi you know, they factory. Pinch them. Uh -huh. Yeah, oh yeah, it was literally a pierogi factory. They're delicious. And this, they made up their own, well, my wife did, other than the traditional, you know, potato and, all right, all I right. think we're in. So now that they're sealed, let's put them on, on this cutting board because it's smaller, and we'll pop these in the freezer okay. for a few minutes just to let them set. So while those are setting, we are going to get started on our second appetizer, which is okay. so easy and so delicious. <laughs> You're going to make these for all of your events. These are blue cheese stuffed dates wrapped in bacon. And if you don't like blue cheese, you can stuff them with whatever cheese you want. And if you don't like cheese, you don't have to stuff them. But everybody likes bacon, I Why think. can't you like blue cheese? I know. I don't know. OK. So I have preheated the oven to 375. We take these dates. Now these dates have pits in them. So we are going to take out some pits. And I'm going to do two, three, four, five, six. We'll make eight because I've made some already. And these are so easy to pit. You know, it's not like olives that take skill to pit. You just cut them in half, open them, and take out the pit. Easy as that. And if you've never worked with dates before, you'll find that they're pretty sticky. But that's all the sugar inside. And when you put them in the oven, we're going to let them cook for at least a half hour. All the sugar caramelizes, and it turns into almost a candy. And it's absolutely delicious. I always think of the, every time I think of dates, I think of Indiana Jones <laughs> and the monkey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can call these monkey. The problem is remember you poison them. Oh, yeah. We're not poisoning these okay. today. Well, no, I don't, I don't need a taste tester for you. I had to have one <laughs> with my first Democratic oh, really? <laughs> Smart. Guest. Dates are great. They're really healthy for you. And they've been around since the beginning of time. And we don't eat enough of them. So once we have all the pits out, I'm going to get rid of this water bowl. Uh, we're going to place them on this cookie sheet. You want a sheet with edges because the bacon will cause some lovely bacon fat to spill off the edges if you don't have the edge on your, on your pan. And then we get our blue cheese. We're just going to cut a few slices and find chunks that will look like they'll fit in the date. And watch how easy it is. It's like they're made for this. You just close it. <laughs> Excellent. It's so easy. Um, so we are going to stuff each date with a little blue cheese. And like I said, if you don't like blue cheese, try whatever your favorite is. I think, though, the, the blue cheese with the, its kind of tartness is going to definitely add to the sweetness. So it probably is a, yeah. you should have like a really, really sharp cheddar or something. Uh huh. It complements it, it really well. Um, I've also, you know, other appetizers, in my theory on bacon, um, I've used um, artichoke hearts out of a can, drained them, and wrapped them in bacon. And I bet you could even figure out a way to put cheese in those. But these are just even simpler to assemble. And you can make these ahead of time, just like the, the, uh, the wontons. Um, put them in the freezer the night before, make these in the morning, put them in the fridge. And then if you're having a party, you're not sweating in the kitchen five minutes before you hear the doorbell ring. I, I, I'm not a very good pre-planner. <laughs> OK, so these are all wrapped. Now comes the good part. We well, see that. I forget who it is, but they have bacon ice cream now. A, a bacon I've heard. Sundae. I don't know where to find it. Oh, it's one of the, is it not friendlies. I forgot. Well, going back to politics, you know, the Iowa State Fair is a must for all these presidential candidates. And I've never been to Iowa um, and never been to the State Fair, but I hear all these stories from colleagues who are out there. And the food that is made at the, <laughs> at the Iowa State Fair, whatever it is, you know, bacon ice cream probably started there. 
and they probably then fried it. Yeah. Because that's what they do yeah, yeah, fried. in Iowa. <laughs> so the candidates leave Iowa feeling, you know, sick to their stomach because they, of course, have to try everything. I cut the bacon in half um, because it's plenty for each of these dates. And we also have toothpicks over here to secure each one. Again, it's really easy. Take the bacon, you roll it around your date, and you secure it with the toothpick. Do you want to try? So it's almost like making scallops and bacon. Yeah, it is. Or people use melon um, yeah. and bacon. So yeah, same, same idea. Our oven is ready. And like I said, this will take about 30, 35 minutes in the oven. And normally I make 20 or 30 at the same time. Um, so you'll use two pans. Um, it will help you. Great. One of the things I found out with being involved in the Perry campaign, at a national level that high, you know, especially like him being the governor of Texas, mm -hmm. it was kind of overwhelming when they came in with, you know, he actually had Secret Service the whole time. Yeah, and that's I'm a different like, dynamic. What is this all about? But if you think about it, you know, being what Texas is, yeah, made sense. But I just was unimpressed with how his national people handled stuff. I thought the local people worked their tails off. Yeah. Um, but the, the national people were so disconnected from, That's a, at least here in New Hampshire, but obviously he didn't go anywhere anywhere else either. But. It's a common, common complaint on presidential primary campaigns because not only are you a campaign set up basically like running for governor in New Hampshire, right? So you set up a full-on statewide campaign mm -hmm. in New Hampshire, and then you have all these conference calls and meetings um, with the national headquarters, and then you have to deal with the other states, too. So there's always a, you know, a campaign operation in Iowa or, and or South Carolina, so they have campaign mm -hmm. staffs. So it's not, it's not as simple as just running a New Hampshire campaign, and people in New Hampshire often don't see what goes on behind the scenes, but there's constantly a, a battle over resources and time. And you know, running the New Hampshire schedule, um, you fight for every minute you can get in New Hampshire because the more time you have here, the higher, we, you know, I believe, the higher your chances of meeting more people and the better you'll do. But it, there's, all, you know, there's always an internal dynamic. If the candidate is from a state that's in the South, then they feel more comfortable in South Carolina. If it's a candidate that's from a state close to the Midwest, they're more comfortable there, or they're maybe a national campaign advisors from there, you know, so there's a lot of internal stuff that goes back and forth. I definitely saw the Perry thing because yeah. they, they made decisions. They basically decided to blow off New Hampshire. Yeah. Now, I was lucky with <clears throat> McCain the first time because in 2000, he decided right off the bat he wasn't going to raise enough money to compete on a national level, but he knew that if he did well in New Hampshire, he'd get noticed. So he just did New Hampshire. He was a sitting U.S. Senator, so we had to deal with that schedule. You know, when a vote came up, we'd have to cancel events, and that was a headache. But he personally committed to just New Hampshire, which was great for us because we didn't have to compete with all the other states. And then he went on to South Carolina and learned <laughs> the lesson really quickly that, oops, we should have probably planned ahead a little bit and had a better operation there. Um, but back then, there were probably three or four weeks between New Hampshire and South Carolina. So it, every year it's different. There's no yeah, two you, campaigns alike. You, I definitely am just watching between now, like switching over to Romney and seeing Ro Romney, obviously, first of all, he has a house here. Yeah. Um, and he's been campaigning here for six years. Yep. So for Perry to think he was going to come in in six months, yeah, six it's, weeks, right? Um, this was not going to happen. It takes a lot of work. A lot of work, and it's not glamorous. <laughs> I, know, I, I can't really imagine not. their day. I honestly God, I can't imagine. I, I took a trip with my wife to California two years ago. We just drove up. The, we started in San Diego and drove up to San Francisco. Beautiful. And I'm saying, just imagine running for governor of this state, and then imagine running for president of the United States. Right. I mean, just California. How do you? How do many that? media markets they have? You know, New Hampshire's a great deal for can That's campaigns right. because you have WMUR. And WMUR. Yeah. So when you're doing your budget, um, you know, your biggest line item on your New Hampshire campaign budget is media, but it's so much smaller than any other state. So if you're a candidate that just really wants to make a splash and try to maximize impact 
early on in the primary, New Hampshire is the place to do it. Now, that's a good question because I, I bet you the audience will love this. What, do you know, what is an average, these 30 second commercials you see that, um, let's say during the primary, they're probably less money yep. than now, right? Yeah. Or are they? Um, so the number that I know, and it, I'm sure there's some fluctuations and I'll probably get some emails from media consultants who disagree with me, but the, the number that I like to, to explain to people is for full saturation in New Hampshire, that's WMUR, and then you pick up some of the Boston, um, some Vermont, and some Maine, but you want full saturation. If you're going up on the air with a 30 second ad, it's about 500 grand a week. Really? Yeah. So well, uh, you can play with that number. You can you can you can just go on cable. You can focus just on WMUR. But if you if you're running for president and you're creating your budget for press um, and you want to do a full saturation, that's, that's that's the number you're like, looking at. Is that like just when it's going to be Romney and Obama, or is that less a primary? That's like just starting out. That's that's a primary number. They might up the rates yeah, for a general election. It's expensive. I lost my train of thought thing in a minute, but I, I, oh, I know what it was. I was doing um, close up. Yeah. And um, Pendel's, you know, because they, you know, they have the new sto uh, studios now. Yeah. And he says, "Welcome to the house that um, Forbes built." Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't really get that at first. I guess he spent so much money. I have a story about that. So I was on the McCain campaign in 1999, <clears throat> leading up to 2000, and Forbes was running for president. And you know Chris Wood. Yeah. Great guy. I've known him since, since I came to New Hampshire because he was working on the Forbes campaign. I was working on the McCain campaign. I was in charge of Rockingham and Stratford counties. I was all of 21. No clue what I'm doing, which is probably the best way to be <laughs> when you're starting because yeah, right. you don't know better. Um, and we were in Exeter at Old Home Days, which is another unique New Hampshire phenomenon. And we, I pulled up my car um, early in the morning to set up my booth. I had my folding table. Um, you know, my McCain literature and uh, some balloons that I had blown up and a sign and my chair and I was ready for the whole day to sit out in the hot sun in downtown Exeter <laughs> next to me, it was, it was like 90 degrees outside, next to me there's this huge operation going on. I have no idea what it is and all of a sudden they roll out the big Forbes banner. He had a full tent, air conditioned. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so of course they got all the, the traffic, you know, going in there and hanging out. They had chairs. It was beautiful, but I, you know. <laughs> We didn't have the resources to, to but that, we won in New Hampshire, so, you know. The house that Forbes built. He, he, uh, he did spend some money here, which is fine, and he's come back a few times over the years to stump for candidates. Well, he was big for Perry. Yeah, people like him. I mean, he's, that's what happens when you spend a lot of time and resources in New Hampshire. You really do build relationships, and these candidates have a special place in their heart for New Hampshire, and they keep coming back. So... Well, we hope we keep getting them here. Yeah, that's, a, that's another story, right? I'm going to grab the pot stickers that have been in the freezer. And let's see how, how good a job we did. So we'll know if they're, if they're good or not already? Well, they can stay in the freezer for a couple hours. I mean, if, would they be opening up? No, they, they'll oh. open up. And <laughs> OK, see? So here's what I'll do. I'll mix them up a little bit. <laughs> we won't know who is this. It's a show game. Yeah. Okay, so let me get ready because what we're going to do, pot stickers when you order them at a restaurant, they're steamed. And you don't need a fancy steamer for this. What, what, um, what I found is it's good to brown them on one side so at least there's some color and a little texture before you flip them over and steam them. Um, and it's really quick. It takes only a couple minutes. So first we're going to heat up the pan with some oil. And I love this stove. My husband is watching, and I want him to notice the stove the that wolf, we're using huh? because this is one that I will want to replicate someday. What do you normally cook at home? Uh, if, if it was one type of food, I would probably say Italian. Mm -hmm. But um, like this time of the year, I do a lot of grilling. Yeah. I'm jealous. Saturday, I made a um, beef brisket. Ooh. Let that cook all day. Wow. It's good. worth it, huh? Yeah, it is. Plus, it gives you a reason to drink beer and smoke cigars. You know, <laughs> yeah, reason to do something. Because you're cooking. <laughs> now, my, my parents, they host a lot of uh, neighborhood gatherings and stuff, and my mom will cook all, everything 
required for a meal, except for the meats, which my dad will do on the grill. And then everyone will go up to my dad after and say, that was delicious, <laughs> exactly. thank you. And my mom's like, wait a second, he just had to stand by the grill for 20 minutes. That sounds like my Thanksgiving. I just make the turkey and the stuffing. Well, that's... They do everything else. Turkey is the main... Well, now, though, everyone's so into the deep fried. We do five turkeys. Oh, yeah. I stuff two, but three of them are deep fried. You make five turkeys. Yeah, it's over 40 people. Wow. And they're all grown men now, the boys. They're wow. giants. They're hungry. Uh, my husband tried to do a fried turkey one year, and it, it worked. We were... I was nervous. <laughs> but it worked and it was delicious. Yeah, if you follow the directions, it works. Yeah, it was really good. Then it just comes out a matter of the rub you use and the uh, injection. Yep. No, I was impressed. So I'm just going to test this oil. Now the one they like that's become the hit, because I tried it one year as a goof, is I made a buffalo one. So when it came out, mm. I made my buffalo sauce, like I was yeah. making buffalo wings, and just poured it all over it. And sealed in. Wow. Now that's all they want is the buffalo turkey. On Thanksgiving? On Thanksgiving. That is, that's impressive. But we're pretty unique. Our Thanksgiving movie is, it's a traditional movie. When, when everything's done, all the football games are over, we're done eating, we had dessert, we all sit down and watch, of course, mm. everyone's Thanksgiving movie, My Cousin Vinny. <laughs> There's no correlation to Thanksgiving whatsoever. It's a tradition. But it's our tradition. It's good to have traditions. I bet your kids will carry on the traditions and their family will, somewhere in 50 years, they'll say, how did we ever start this? Or, boy, that grandfather was crazy. <laughs> well, all right. I think it must be hot enough. So let's try one and see what happens. Uh, not quite. Well, that you got to cast iron pants with. Yeah. I'll let it heat up another second. So like I said, we're going to put them all in and wait until they get brown. And then I'm going to flip them and I'm going to add a little bit of water. And that'll make steam in the pan. I'll cover it. Um, and it will be. So what do you think is going to happen this election? I think that there will be twists and turns, as, it, as there always is. And the way, the way our country is set up right now with electoral states, um, it's going to be really close. I think it's just built that way these days, our, our country. And so the candidates are going to focus on probably six states. New Hampshire will be one of them, which is good news for us. Um, and good news for Romney, too. Uh, and I think that between now and November, there will be several ups and downs for both campaigns. And it's just a matter of how, they're, how nimble they are and how they'll take advantage of opportunities. Because you, know, you can plan a perfect campaign and have everything in place, but there's always going to be the unknown, always. And you have to, the best campaign is prepared to, to handle that. So um, I think both campaigns have professionals and have been through the ringer before. Uh, this isn't Romney's first you know, trip to the rodeo. And I think that it'll be really interesting to watch. And, and they must, don't they, if you're, if you're going to run for a very high office, I would even think um, governor in this state, mm -hmm. you have your campaign manager. It, it must be like your attorney. When he sits down with the very first thing you must ask him, the very, one of the very first interviews, where are all the skeletons? Right. And to give you an evaluation. You have if you're to gonna do that. So it always never fails to amaze me that one comes up, for example, the Herman Cain thing is right. probably the best example. I mean, come on. He didn't know that was going to happen? Right. Really? Right. And that's, that's, that's shame on, on him, but it's also shame on the people who are advising him who wanted to ignore. Because they had to know is the yeah. point. Yeah. And you can't ignore it. It's, gonna, it's cutthroat. I mean, this is a brutal business. And your, you know, your past is, is fair game if you're running for president of the United States. So, um, yeah, you have to be prepared to be honest with the people that you work with and then trust that those people will handle it. And a lot of times, it's best to put forth your flaws yourself. I brag about the objection. So Absolutely. 101. Well, so. your past is fair game if you're a Republican. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I would like to see anyone run with Obama's past as a Republican. Right. I don't care if he was black, from Mars, whatever. If he was Republican and he had that past, forget about it. Yeah. Because they didn't care about Herman Cain. I think last time I checked, he was black. Right. It's, it's 
high stakes poker. <laughs> That's why I, I tell this story all the time. The McCain thing last time, I remember going to uh, Salem High and watching Sarah Palin give her speech. Mm -hmm. And I left, there was my wife, and a friend, and, and my youngest son, he was like nine at the time. And uh, I said, it's all over. And I said, what do you mean? And I, I, I could just tell. When Sarah Palin first joined the campaign, she came out swinging. Yeah. She was going after Wright, after Bill Ayers, after everything. And then McCain shut her up. Mm -hmm. And once he did that, it was the only time he had to lead, by the way. And then, yep. and that's why I say right now I'm involved in the Romney campaign, but he's, he can't do that. Yeah. He has to go after this guy with everything you got. Yep. Expose him for what he is. They should just let me do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'd get him. When's Romney going to come on your cooking show? I haven't even met him yet. <gasps> Shush. You're supposed to have met him four times by now. Yeah. Well, I'm not, oh. I don't live in Whitefield. Right. <laughs> when I say met him, like people want to, I mean, I've met him several times. Right. Hello, shook his hand. Right. Introduced, but never like sat down and talked to him. Yeah. Where Perry actually came to my house. Yeah. Um, we did a little barbecue thing. Now, I worked with Luke Kraus. Yeah. I hired Luke um, to work on the Palenti campaign, and he went on to the Perry campaign. And now he's with the OVA campaign. And when I hired him, he was um, fresh out of college. And it was fun to watch him go through the same yeah. things that I went through, because I could say things like, oh, you're going to love it. <laughs> you could drive up to you know, middle of nowhere, spend the day, put up signs. You're going to love it. And he didn't know better. So there's, it's fun with uh, the new generation of campaign staffers being from where I am, uh, in, in terms of experience, to watch them just eagerly, passionately get out there and stump for their candidates and you know, things that I wouldn't want to do anymore, they just love well, to do. Well, Luke, I've become pretty close to Luke. He's, He's a great. great kid. He's a rising star. I, I say that now. So I just finished flipping these. So either way, both of ours worked. Yes, so far so good. Because there's only five and four of them work. I'm going to add a little water. I'm going to cover it and let it steam. You see that? So far, I'm a so wonton good. pincher. You are. <laughs> I like to just give it a little shake every now and then. So those are steaming for about two, three minutes until there's hardly any water left. Okay. Um, and if you're doing this for a party, I could have put probably some more in there and you could have another pan going. Um, and then once they're, once they're finished, you can just take them off and cover them with foil to keep them warm. Um, but you don't want to serve these cold to your guests. While they're, do while they're um, steaming, we're going to make a little dipping sauce, which is really easy. I've got, saved my scallions here that I'm going to put on top. But all the, uh, the sauce is actually right in front of you, yeah. soy sauce. Sesame seeds and water. Sesame. And the sesame seeds just add a little, little flair. So I'm going to do, oh, I don't know, about a fourth a cup or so of soy sauce, and then about half that amount of water, just to dilute it a little bit. It's really that easy. I'm almost embarrassed how easy it is. A little hey. sesame seed for garnish. So now these look like they're ready. They do. And they're really hot. So we're going to put them on this plate here and let them sit for a minute and cool off. And like I said, you know, these aren't like fried wontons. These are steamed pot stickers. I just like to brown one side, so I think they look prettier. I personally like them better steamed anyways. When I go to the restaurant, my favorite um, sushi place, I always get steamed. You can get it either way. And then if you're serving this and you want presentation points, you can put a little scallion on top. And I'll show you what that looks like. So, so here we have, we have it. the party. We have our... Pot stickers that are stuffed with butternut squash. Yes, and ginger and uh, scallions. And then, of course, our dates stuffed with blue cheese and wrapped in bacon. Correct. Which I'm getting ready to try right now. Yes, please do. 
I'll put it on a plate just so I look somewhat civilized. <laughs> <laughs> it even has a candy crunch it's to bacon it. Bacon candy. Oh, it's delicious. It's a crowd pleaser, and you can make them way ahead of time. No cholesterol. No, <laughs> they're good for you. <laughs> oh, they really are delicious. Good. I'm glad you like them, and, and you can imagine any. You can stuff them with whatever whatever you feel like. I think the blue cheese is perfect. Yeah, it balances out the sweet. Good. I'll give that a second. I'll try one of those. Yeah, they're a little hot. Um, and you can serve these um, as an appetizer before dinner, or if you have a big party, like I said, you probably want to wait until they're cool, but you don't want to serve them too cold. I'll move them closer to you. And then they're really good dipped in the... If I ever have something that's not out of the pan that I haven't burned my mouth on, it would be a first. <laughs> I'm going to give this another minute, though. So again, before we go, I want to thank Sarah for being here. I want to wish you all the best with your new life, especially thank with the you. baby coming. I am due in December. We're very excited. And um, you get three more to catch up to me. But <laughs> Are you going to get back into it. politics? Um, uh, it's, it's in my blood. Uh, and my husband and I met through politics. Um, Chris Stewart is on the school board in Manchester, so even if, you know, we uh, sit out, I'm staying out of the primaries right now in, in New Hampshire, I think that our candidates are great. Uh, I want to see them all do well, um, but I'm sure eventually um, I'll be inspired by somebody early on and jump on the bandwagon again. We'll probably see you in the trail. Yeah. Let me try these before we go. Okay. I think my, my mouth is seasoned enough. Mm. Did it work? Really good. Good. Once again, thank you, everyone. Next week, another episode of The Silver Skillet. And my thanks once again to... This was great. Sarah Stewart. I think I said your maiden name the last time. Crawford. Some people know me as Crawford, but I'm Sarah anyway, Stewart. Like Sarah Martha Stewart. Stewart. There you go. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thanks again to Jerry Roth. Thank you.